Hey, and good evening. Um, welcome to uh, the End Time Prophecy Watch um, Bible study this evening. Um, we came on live on Sunday trying to get adjusted. Um, we'll be doing our Bible study tonight. Uh, we did a short teaching on uh, Ezekiel 38 on Sunday night. So um, tonight's Bible study primarily uh, I put in the comment section of uh, Bible study that short Bible study that we did on Sunday. Um, false prophets, croaking frogs, uh, lying signs and wonders in the last day. So um, it's a lot that's going on. Um, a lot that we need to be in tune um, spiritually. So um, let's buckle up. Get ready to get into the word of God. Got a lot to cover uh, this evening. Um, hopefully you'll be blessed by the teaching that we'll be doing. Um, hopefully we get some people on that will um, be in tune to um, share. Um, try to put things out that are thought provocative, that are going to equip the same, especially um, in these last and evil days. Um, I'm going to pray right quick before we get started because we do need the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to um, lead and guide me where I teach this lesson um, despite um, all the preparation to teach. Um, we just need God's will to be done. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, um, for this night. We thank you for um, this Bible study that we'll be doing, um, give an ear to hear those who will tune in, those who will tune in later, oh Lord, to really see your word and really seek you for themselves and be endowed by your spirit and not be deceived in these last and evil days, oh Lord. We thank you and praise you, oh Lord, for your goodness and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're going to get started. I am going to be reading from, um, I'm going to start off from Luke. Uh, I'm going to start off from Luke chapter 11. And I'll be reading from verse 29. That'll be Luke. Um, that'll be Luke. And it reads... And this is talking about seeking a sign. Um, and while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this evil, this is an evil generation. It seeks signs and no sign will be given to accept the sign of Jonah, the prophet. So here's Jesus. He talks about, he's telling, um, he's teaching, um, he's in. Um, the environment where he tells um, the listeners that you guys are evil generation, you seek for a sign. Now, even when you look at the history of Israel, um, they saw a lot of signs and wonders and miracles that took place. Um, you can see um, the exodus, exodus event that occurred that they saw um, the plagues, they saw the hand of God, they saw a lot of different things that took place um, and they got out in the wilderness and Moses is up in the mount receiving the commandments. Um, they started throwing a wild party, started wilding out, built a golden calf and the rest was history. Uh, Moses came down and soon after that judged the people because um, they didn't want to keep God's commandments. So due to the fact that they saw all the signs and wonders and miracles and all, um, they still did not keep God's word. Uh, one of the main things that stands out with, um, with the prophet Samuel and King Saul um, in first um, Samuel chapter 15, he, um, Samuel says, he tells Saul, um, obedience is better than sacrifice. Uh, maintaining God's word um, 
is more than experiencing things in a mystical um, experience where you are, well, I felt this way and, and I felt this. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, you got to test everything based on the word of God, not based on your feelings, not based on your emotions, not based on your own understanding. Uh, so we really want to get into um, those things up on um, tonight because it's vitally important. We live in the last days. One of the main things that Jesus did warn several times in um, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, um, it talks about wars and rumors of wars. It talks about famines. Um, it talks about a whole lot of other things and all. But one of the key things that is almost repetitive, at least four times mentioned, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, talks about um, in the last days to number one, test the spirit. Uh, number two, the study for yourself um, to make sure those things line up with the word of God. And we live in an age of deception. So you see all these people proclaiming to be prophets and we just take their word for it. Uh, we need to be testing um, the spirit. We need to be in tune to the word of God. We need to be even more so um, students of the Bible, not to say that you've been in church for 20 and 25, 20 to 25, 30 years. If you still aren't biblically sound and you're not grasping biblical truth, um, that's an issue. So you have to be able to um, proceed, um, be a lifetime student when it comes to the word of God, because you have to continue to grow in leaps and bounds and learning the word of God and cultivate your spirit um, by the word of God, not by spiritual experiences, but making sure if you have a spiritual experience to test it and to make sure it lines up with the word. Um, we're talking about seeking signs. Um, bring up several examples. We can look um, back in 2008 uh, the Lakeland, Florida revival with Todd Bentley. Uh, everybody in our mama was flocking down to Florida because it was the hottest revival that was going on. Um, God TV at the time, um, I had cable TV. I haven't had TV. My wife and I have not had uh, TV um, for the last 12 some odd years, uh, which, you know, it's a blessing within our household because it can become a major um, distraction, but they were promoting him as this great uh, prophetic voice, um, had lots of signs and wonders going on and just a bunch of different things that was taking place. Um, and they were hyping him so much and they were running consecutively. Um, I think every single day they were televising the revival and um, it, it was just going on and people were making um, pilgrimages down to Lakeland to get Todd Bentley's anointing and just all this other stuff and um, strange doctrines and other things was happening, but people were basing things off experience and not the word of God. Now, here's a man that proclaimed that a lot of his miracles and signs and wonders and his healings was contribute to his female angel called Emma, you know, and he had manifestations of like gold dust and all these other things and all, which you hear about in some of these charismatic meetings and all gold dust and angel feathers. And you hear this at um, Bethel Church in Reading, um, experience these things, but it's not tested by the word of God. So it's a lot of signs and wonders that are taking place. So. Here you have Todd Bentley doing all these different signs and quote unquote wonders. Um, and as a cash cow, too, because um, collecting offering every night, bringing in lots of money. I mean, it was a well oiled machine. It was it, it, it was it it was really going on. It was really hyped and going on and to the point where um, see, see Peter Wagner, the one who came up with um, 
th this network of apostles and prophets and or these super apostles and prophets came down to Lake Lanham and Bill Johnson um, at Bethel and Redding and Shayon who's out here in Pasadena, um, uh, California who proclaims to be an apostle and um, Rick Joyner, um, all of them came on the stage and prayed for Todd Bentley and proclaimed all these wonderful prophecies and that the Lord was came was really up on him and he's anointed to really do great things and um, endorsing all these wild things that he was doing yet and still um, these lion signs and wonders this man was having an affair with his secretary, left his wife for another woman, was in an adulterous relationship, and none of these so-called people that are so-called prophets that was prophesying all these blessings over him, endorsing his ministry, can, could even see what was going on. So people were duped into these signs and wonders that they were seeing and not judging on the fruit. Jesus even talks about you should know them by their fruit, not by their gift. So you don't you don't go off spiritual experiences and supernatural things. I believe in the gifts of the spirit. I'm not a um, satanist where the gifts of the spirit um, has ceased. Um, that's an error and a lie from from the enemy. But you see this going on. Um, another example I want to use also too in regards to supernatural uh, experiences and manifestations, signs, and wonders. Uh, this happened between the year uh, 1968 to uh, 1971 in Egypt. Um, there were apparitions of the quote unquote Virgin Mary started to appear um, several times a week there in um, Zatan, um, Egypt, and quote unquote. Mary was performing signs and wonders and healings and most of the spectators were Muslims that were coming to, she was appearing at this um, Coptic church there in Egypt and all these manifestations and things that was taking place. And I had an opportunity, um, I was on a mission trip, one of the guys from my church, which was Egyptian, um, started telling me about the story because um, he was around that time, he was of age around that time, and he told me that he was a child and his mother, <laughs> actually it was funny, he was like, yeah, I was too sleepy to go see Mary that night, but his mother wanted to take him to uh, see the apparition of Mary, to see everything that was going, going on, and um, he lived during that time. So you had these experiences that were actually valid signs and wonders going on, but did it line up with the word of God, seeing the apparitions of the Virgin Mary, just other things and all, it just doesn't line up. I'm going to read um, a couple of quotes from Derek Prince, uh, the late great Derek Prince. He had this to say in his book, uh, Protection from Deception, um, page seven, um, which he makes very interesting quotes. I'm a quote um, from his book, Protection from Deception. And then I'm a also quote from one of his sermons that he did um, back in December of 2002 about protection against um, deception. Very eye opening, um, very relevant to what we're seeing, um, especially um, this was like almost 20 some odd years ago, between 20 to like 18 years ago or more. Um, so it's very relevant than what, what we're seeing right now. Here's what he had to say. He says, many Christians assume that every supernatural sign must be from God, forgetting that Satan or the devil is completely capable of performing supernatural signs and wonders. Here's a quote from his sermon, Protection, Protecting Yourself Against Deception. He says, bear in mind, Satan is capable of producing power and signs and wonders. I have frequently commented that the obvious place 
for the Antichrist to arise would be the charismatic movement because most charismatics seem to think that anything supernatural must be from God. That's so Satan is capable of great supernatural signs and wonders. So how do we protect ourselves? He goes on and says, and with all unrighteousness and deception, pretty much he's quoting um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is one of the verses I'll get into in, in his Bible study. He says, with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So here's where I want to get into because false prophets are like croaking frogs. So I want to tie in Revelation chapter 16, but I want to look at the backdrop because when you're studying the book of Revelation, you have to take under consideration a combination of things. If you're um, a Bible student of the word of God, when you start studying the book of Revelation, you have to study the whole entire Bible to understand the book of Revelation because it's the culmination of all things. So you have to study the Torah. You have to study the first five books of Moses. You have to study the prophets. You have to study all those things because it incorporates the whole entirety of the word of God in the book of Revelation. So when you're looking at Revelation, um, it's incorporating things from Leviticus and other things in all Deuteronomy. Um, it's incorporating the different writings of the prophets, um, Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. So it's incorporating so much different things. Also, too, when we're looking at Bible prophecy, also, too, from a Jewish point of view, it's a pattern that repeats itself. So, and even Paul talks about um, the Old Testament is examples. When we read the Old Testament, it's also examples also too. So, when we look at Revelation, we see the two beasts, um, the false prophet and the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist. Um, and then we see the two witnesses also too in the book of Revelation. Um, Types and shadows also, too, you can see that with the book of Exodus, with uh, Moses and Aaron being a type of shadow of the two witnesses. You can see um, Pharaoh being symbolic of Satan and Janus and Jamboree's, um, the Egyptian uh, musicians that were working lion signs and wonders are symbolic also, too, are a symbol or type of shadow of the two beasts that we see in Revelation. So when we go to Ex Exodus chapter eight, verse verses six through eight, it says, so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the musicians did so with the enchantments and brought up frogs in the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. So here you see in this instance that Pharaoh, they worship all these false gods, the gods of Egypt and Yahweh, the true living God, um, Almighty, God Almighty was judging them and judging the people of Egypt, but also judging the gods of Egypt was overrun by these, these frogs. Um, and they were like, you need to get these frogs on out of there. But we also see within that scripture, um, verse seven, it says that the musicians, they also did enchantments and brought up frogs too. So they were able to produce signs and wonders also too not to the magnitude that Moses and Aaron were but they were able to produce lion signs and wonders through occult practices and other things and all that you've seen that they were able um, to do so we have to keep in mind that the enemy can emulate if you're not 
if you're not walking in discernment, you're not walking in the spirit, you can get caught off guard into believing that spiritual experiences, even if there are lying signs and what it must be God. Oh, it was it was the church was banging, it was popping, all signs of wonders. We were falling out, we were dancing, we were shouting, we were leaping and doing all these other things, but you didn't did you ever stop to test the spirit? People get so intoxicated, the spiritual things sometimes, and you get so intoxicated in a service, oh, I was high in the spirit and I was drunk in the spirit, but that's contrary to the word of God because the word of God says to be sober-minded, um, to be sober-minded and you have to be able to um, rightfully divide the word of God. Also to the word warns us, Paul warns us that there'll come a day where people won't endure sound doctrine. So people don't want to hear about good doctrinal teaching, but you want supernatural experiences and prophetic words spoken over to you um, that you're going to be rich and you're going to be famous and all these other things and all. And a lot of times there's nothing more than clairvoyance, nothing more than um, divination and other things that are taking place that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, nothing to do with the will of God. So when we look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, it talks about how the gods of Egypt being judged. It says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and I will strike all the firstborn. This is talking about the Passover, the very first Passover in the land of Egypt, both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So we're going to move on to the main premise that I really want to hit on and we're going to build from there is in Revelation chapter 16, which talks about Satan, which talks about the false prophet, and it talks about the first um, beast, which is the Antichrist, how they're working, lying signs and wonders, and these demons spirits are coming out as they're speaking coming out their frogs as frogs unclean spirits are doing all these lying signs and wonders to deceive people so when we look at revelation chapter 16 um verse 12 through 14 it says and the sixth angel poured out his bow on the great euphrates and its waters was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. So he saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to things, to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather to battle that great day of God Almighty. So note also too, I mentioned earlier, you have to, when studying Revelation, you have to read the whole entire Bible because um, it incorporates lots of different parts of the word. So when you look at Leviticus chapter 11, when it talks about um, God has given Moses what animals are clean, what are unclean. One of the things that falls within an unclean animal is frogs in Leviticus chapter 11. So when you look at symbolism and other things and all in the book of uh, Revelation, in particular, Revelation 16, when it's talking about unclean spirits. Um, this is what it's referring to when you look at Leviticus, frogs are unclean spirits. Another thing when you look at frogs, frogs most of the time come out at night and they croak at night. So the creatures of uh, the night. So you look at the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, um, Satan, the dragon um, is part of the king or uh, is the king over the kingdom of darkness. Um, you see that the beast and the false prophet are incorporated in the beast system or the kingdom of, of darkness. And they're espousing these lying, these demonic, unclean spirits to deceive people doing these signs and wonders. 
It even talks about in the book of Revelation how they'll be able to bring fire down and work all these lying signs and wonders that are going to deceive the masses, those who do not love the Lord, those who are not in tune by the spirit of God, those who are not keeping the commandments of God. So when we start looking at frogs um, to the Egyptians, the frog was a symbol of life and fertility since millions of them were born after the annual flooding of the Nile, which brought fertility to otherwise barren lands. Also, too, um, within the Egyptians, um, frog was symbolic of fertility, but also resurrection also, too. So you see that incorporated. It says, consequently, in Egyptian mythology, there were, had began to be a frog goddess who represented fertility, and her name was Hikita. Hikita was depicted as a frog or a woman with a frog's head, or more rarely as a frog on the end of a phallic um, symbol to explicitly indicate the association with fertility. And lesser known Egyptian god Kek was also sometimes shown in the form of a frog. Another thing, when we look at folk religion and occultism, the frog has also became associated with witchcraft or as an ingredient of a love potion. So a lot of people fall in love with a lot of false prophets that come through um, the church. They're able to seduce you. Um, they're able to persuade you. They're able to have you and pins and needle and and can work um they read my mail they knew my address they knew um the bank where i banked at they um they read like my bank account i put up my checkbook well most people don't carry checkbooks um they knew my debit card they knew the pin number um, they knew it to a t they knew my grandma and they knew all this stuff and you're not like testing uh, the spirit you don't have sometimes within um, ministries um, church leadership they don't test they don't judge prophecy um, they're not testing the people that they bring in um, sometimes and a lot of times and I'm gonna say most but um, on the most part some of these pastors they bring in um, these people because they know they're gonna get a good crowd it's gonna be a good show they're gonna get people stirred up um, it's going to be an overflow in the offering buckets and it's good business for them and they know but they're not looking at the long-term um picture of potential damage that they're doing they're not like having um when you have one person that's in charge the uh, quote-unquote pastor i'm i'm the head of this church but you're not like um governing um the church like they did in the early church where you have a group of elders, you're not just one a one man show making decisions, stuff like that. You have people that are um, maybe able to see certain things that you can't see. Um, certain other people, even when you look at that, when those group of prophets in Antioch got together and they prayed in the Holy Spirit, they fasted, they prayed in the Holy Spirit. It just wasn't one individual. It was a group of them began to pray and the Holy Spirit told them separate Paul and Barnabas. It wasn't like some um, some great prophet that came in for a, a prophetic conference or a revival speaking prophetic words. And just even with that being said, when things happen like that, church leadership needs to take into account Okay, that's fine. Let's see if these things be true. Let's judge it. Let's go by the word word of God. Let's test the spirit. Um, let's also to look and discern is this person producing righteous fruit? Does this person have good fruit? Or is this person, when you have them come to your church, sleeping with every sister in the church and they get numbers and they know when they're coming out, to a certain location and they have some of their women set up in certain cities and certain states let them know ahead of time hey i'm gonna i'm gonna be out there for a revival i'm gonna hit you up let's go out xyz 
you need to pastors you need to be testing the spirit you need to be also testing the fruit you need to be in discernment and not just looking at um how people are wooed and and how charismatic um the person is preaching and doing all this prophesying and everything because even in the early church um when people moved in the prophetic they just didn't move like a snap of a finger unless they didn't prophesy unless the spirit truly moved truly moved them to prophesy i'm gonna read on so we look at some of the writings of uh, the Jewish uh, philosopher Philo, which talks about frogs. Um, we look at the works of Philo, sacrifices of Cain, um, 69. He says, but Pharaoh, the squanderer of all things, not being able to himself to, to receive conception of virtues unconnected with time, insomuch he mutilated as to the eyes of his soul, by which alone incorporeal natures or cor comprehended would not endure to be benefited by virtues unconnected with time, but being weighed down by soulless opinions, soulless opinions, I mean by here, by frogs, animals which utter sound and noise, wholly voided, and destitute of reality. So here's what Philo has to say in regards to um, Philo on dreams. That's um, Philo 2, 259 and 260. He says, thus, therefore, by tracing it out diligently, we have found that praiseworthy speech is likened to river, but speech which is deserving of blame is the river of the e Egypt itself, untraceable, unwilling to learn, as one may say in a word, lifeless speech, for by which reason it's also changed into blood and not being able to afford sustenance. For speech of ignorance is not wholesome and is productive of bloodless, lifeless frogs, which utter only a novel and harsh sound, a noise painful, to the ear, and it is said likewise that all the fish that were in the river were destroyed, and by the fish are here figuratively meant the conception, for these things float about and exist in speech, as in the river, resembling living things, filling the river with life, but uninstructed speech, all conception die. For it is possible to find anything intelligent in it, but only as one has said, some disorderly um, musical voices and jackdaws. So when we look at frogs are chosen to represent deceptive spirits, partly because of the characteristics of croaking, which is loud, but meaningless. So you have people quote unquote, come in, all these prophets are being loud and croaking, croak, croak, gribbit, 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 and not saying anything, not speaking, thus said the wor word of the Lord, not speaking the word of the Lord, not speaking sound doctrine, um, speaking um, damnable heresies, heretical teaching, heretical preaching, but Oh, it made me feel good. It made me it made me dance. It made me shout. But after you ran and shout, did you go and and really review the service and really were you really hearing? You know, I have a background in social science and I know like psychology and all this other stuff that you can incorporate and you can put somebody in a hypnotic suggestion where and I've seen it. I've been in services where um, the the prophet will get the people so high and um, the music gets to going so high and the drums get to going, the organ gets all cranked up and people get the dancing and shouting and they know certain keywords and they open you up because you're so intoxicated 
and they open you up for a suggestion and they open up the prayer line. Oh, I got a word for you. I got a word for you. I got a word for you. You know, and I've heard like certain prophets give people the same, like different people, the same type of prophecy. Oh, your son's going to the NFL. You told that other person oh, a year ago the same thing. Oh, you're going to be the next Tyler Perry, which is kind of contradicts the word anyway, because Tyler Perry is a cross dresser. Bible talks about that Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse five, other things and all. But you're giving somebody a prophetic word or quote unquote prophetic word. And you saying it's the Lord. You're lying on the Lord um, and it doesn't line up with scripture. But again, you can get people open for a suggestion. Now give a seed. You, you need to sow the seed to to really seal this prophetic word I gave you. Sow a seed. And then they start grabbing stuff and um, Psalm 91, if I can get 100 people from um, Psalm 91 that the Lord is um, going to protect you from um, demonic powers and you sow this seed, God's going to make you a millionaire. And it's all a game. So we got to be we got to be able to like know what's true and what's not true amen so you got a lot of croaking frogs out there you got people just croaking 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 and not speaking the word god i believe it's amos 8 and 11 says it won't be a famine in the last days for food but it'll be a famine for hearing the word of the lord so you're so caught up I felt this way and I really felt the spirit, but it's not lining up with the word of God. It is not God. God's word never changed. You can't change God's word. If it's not lining up with the word of God, it's false. Plain and simple. I don't care how, what you saw, what you felt. There's lying, deceiving spirits that's out there that can work lying signs and wonders. And if you don't love the truth of God's word, you can be easily deceived and led down to a road of destruction. I'm going to go over to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, a sign or a wonder comes to pass, which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which, have, which you have not known, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer or dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. So, the main question is, do you hold fast to your favorite prophet or do you hold fast to the word of God? Because so much things that go in the church world is centered around branding and personalities. And we have trust in personalities and brands and other things and all. But we don't have trust in God's word. We don't love truth. So if our favorite prophet is giving us smooth prophecies, prophesying things that are according to our will and not the will of God, then you need to really be in tune to making sure not my will, but thy will be done, Lord. And this person is speaking to the desires of my heart, but it may not be your, your desire. We don't like questioning that. Oh, that person read my book. They read my mail. They knew exactly what I desired. And people get led astray. And this talks about, do you really love his commandments? It'll, it'll come a time. We're living in a day. It's coming to that time anyway. We're in that day anyway um, of great testing. So um, we have to ask ourselves, do we love him? Or are we going to keep his commandments? 
I'm going to read some of the um, incorporate and build up on some of the things from Deuteronomy chapter 13, some of the Jewish rabbinical writings, um, false prophets. Um, this is from Rabbi um, Samuel Ben Mir um, on false prophets and miracles. He says, because Yahweh is testing you, God granted powers to the forces of sorcery to be able to protect the future in order to test the Israelites to increase their merit. He warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 and 13, that there not be among you a soothsayer, a diviner, a sorcerer. You must be wholehearted with Yahweh, your God, if the Israelites refrain from believing in the signs of uh, adulterous prophets, it will be to their merit. Amen. So it would be to that to their merit. I'm gonna read another rabbinical um, writings from Rabbi Nisim of Marcellus. He says, "With this test of the false prophet, your wisdom will be tested. You can develop through." it a strong character trait, namely following truth, because it is the truth. Furthermore, through this is the whole world will know that you hold firmly to your beliefs. And this will be the proof and test whether you love the truth with all your heart, with all your souls. In other words, whether you hold firmly to the truth and believe it because it is the truth and know it with the intellectual knowledge, not merely because of tradition or because you are following the custom of your fathers. For one who knows the truth will not grow indolent about it and will not have doubts on account of a sign or a wonder that a false prophet performs to discredit it. So you have to be grounded in truth. You have to love truth. You, you have to really be grounded in the truth of God's word. Because if you don't, you're going to believe a lie, which leads me into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. And it reads, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. So with all power, signs, lying wonders, verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the true that they might be saved. So, so folks, Folks ain't going to be saved because they don't love truth. This is talking about folks that are church, church folks. They don't love truth. It says, and for this reason, God will send them, God will send them a strong delusion. They should believe a lie that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So when you look at the book of Revelation and you look at the beast and the false prophet, those are judgments sent by God himself. He, and he's gonna let Satan, he's gonna let Satan have his time because people, it's like, okay, you don't love truth? I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you be able to have all the pleasure you want, all the fornication, all the sex, all the, adult, all, all the adultery, all the drugs you want to have, everything that you want to have, and you don't want to, you don't love the truth of my word, I'm going to give you over to deception. I'm going to give you, I'm going to totally give you over to that that you really gonna think that's the truth 
Now, at the end of the at the end of the day, you played yourself. So, this is Paul writing. People sitting up in church. Follow all the traditions. Churching on Sunday, clubbing on Saturday night, churching on Sunday, Monday, going through all your different things and just think because that you proclaim the name of the Lord. And even some of these lying, bootleg, false prophets, preachers and all these other things and all. Jesus says. It's going to come a day. They're going to be like, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out? Devil's in your name. He's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I, ne I never, I never knew you. Like you did like all this stuff. I never, I never knew you. So um, we have to ask the Lord to really open up our eyes and give us the grace. And it's a shame to say, don't just be thinking that Pastor, Pastor, he's 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 my priest. You, what I learned early on from the first, very first pastor. I mentioned this before um, from Bishop James, the late great Bishop James Newman. He's like, don't believe. You go home and study. Do Bible study. You go home. You study it for yourself to make sure what I said was the truth. And I always lived by that. That was a great foundation being a teenager, starting off in that ministry when I was 17, 18 years old to get that foundation to know that because some of these pastors will let these people come in. And I've sat in the pastor's uh, um, one pastor's office and he was like, and it was one sister had concern about her laying hands on people and some other things and all. And he's like, oh, I like seeing that. People falling out and some other things and all. And I was just like, are you really like in tune to the spirit? Because they look at the results. People are falling out and they're running and they're dancing and, and the offering basket is running over, it's flowing over and um, like milk and honey and just other stuff like that. And um, we're doing great. Like we're breaking records on offering, uh, but they're not looking at the other things properly discerning and testing, um, testing the spirits. Uh, I want to get into what some of the early Christian writings have to say about false prophets. Um, again, because we're talking about lying signs and wonders. Um, it's just. Uh, I think a lot that goes on within uh, ministry, within church. Uh, prophetic ministry is not really properly taught. Our people don't, our, a lot of pastors are really ignorant. Um, background, going in, even, even from um, the Hebraic Jewish point of view of the prophets and even what the early Christians taught about prophets so when they see stuff and then they're like wow this person really knew that person's information and everything's and they proclaim this person is a so-and-so prophet and um and i'm not saying all prophets are bad but we live in a day and age you, you better be testing everything you can't just take things as a grain of salt but this is what um the dedica uh have to say about early Christian writings have to say about uh, false prophecies, but not everyone who speaks in the spirit is a prophet. Rather, only if he holds the ways of the Lord, therefore, from their ways will the false prophet and the true prophet will be known. Every prophet who teaches the truth, if he does not do what he teaches, he's a false prophet. But whoever says in the spirit, give me, listen to this, whoever says in the spirit, give me money or something else 
you should not listen to him. But if he says to you to give for the sake of others who are in need, let no one judge him. So <laughs> you got so many people that come through churches and run the seed offering lines and you don't hear none of that stuff going, none of that money, they ain't asking none of that money to go to like mission, mission, you know, for missionaries or missions to go over to the Middle East to uh, evangelize Muslims or anything or go over to Africa someplace or uh, go over to like India or someplace. You're not that most of that time, especially when you see that that bootleg false prophet is wearing thousand dollar suits. Wear nice shoes. Um, to talk about women being modest, you seeing these men wearing this stuff, um, Rolex watches and all this other stuff and all. And a lot of that money is going to their lifestyle and they merchandise the people. So um, the dedicate makes that very clear that if a prophet says, give me money, it's a false prophet. He probably never heard this type of teaching before. They pull stuff out from the air. Um, they, I've seen people, um, I believe it's called Bibliomancy, where they take a scripture and uh, they add a number to it. Um, I've seen somebody do it. They took Genesis 22 and 1, and uh, the so-called apostle said, okay, we're going to, I need... A hundred people to give me two hundred and twenty-one dollars, cause I read Genesis uh, chapter twenty-two, verse one, and it talked about Abraham and Abraham was the father of faith and all these other stuff, pulling the stuff, and it's a way of manipulation and merchandising um, the people. So again, when you hear somebody, next time you hear somebody. Oh, give a seed. I hear like a hundred people, give me a thousand dollars. That's a false prophet. That's that's a false prophet. And if you see also too, all these people that come by, people can maintain keeping a building and just a bunch of other stuff and uh the overhead of the ministry and everything. Um at our church, we don't even take up offering. We have offering boxes in the back and the way our church is conducting and everything, our church is pretty much debt free and we don't run um, seed offerings and, and gimmicks, gimmicks like that at all. Um, we, don't, we don't do that type of stuff and pretty much our church is debt free without doing seed offerings, doing a bunch of prophetic conferences and the other stuff um, for a money grab and all. Here's the writing of Hermes. Talks about false prophets. It says, the false prophet does not have the power of the divine spirit in him. Therefore, he answers his hearers according to their inquiries, according to the wicked desires. He fills their souls with expectations according to their own wishes. For being himself empty, he gives empty answers to empty inquirers. So he gives empty answers to empty inquirers. You can look, and I've been in services, you can look at some of these false prophets when they come in. They can smell and sense a sucker in the congregation. Like, look, oh, call me up. I, I, I want a word. I want a word. And they give them a word. You're going to be a millionaire and it's going to be multi-million dollar business and just some other things. And all. I heard one bishop do an offering. And it was like, I need 10 people. I'm just trying to remember, but it was a hundred dollar offering. God's going to make you a millionaire. I don't think not one of those people that got up in that offering line that gave that money to this day 
and I'm, that must be at least a good, like, almost 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, and not one single one of those people is a millionaire. And then how they dupe you also, too, and they get you on, well, you just didn't have enough faith when you sowed the seed. That's, that's the disclaimer and all, but they done manipulated you out of money and all. But again, we have to be aware of manipulation, lying signs and wonders and all, and people, a lot of times these people um, dupe or dupe the congregation because it's the love of money, which is the root of all evil. I'm going to go over to Irenaeus had this to say, um, early Christian writings of Irenaeus about false prophets. He says, he will also judge false prophets who do not receive the gift of prophecy from God. They are not possessed of the fear of God either. Instead, either for the sake of vain glory or with a view to some personal advantage, or acting in some other way under the influence of a wicked spirit, they pretend to utter prophecies while at the same time they lie against God. They lie against God. Some of these people, I'm like, man, you got a lot of blood on your hands. You don't have the fear of the Lord whatsoever, um, which is just, it's just astonishing how people and I won't name names, but I know of of people that see ministries of so-called prophets and prophecies who didn't end well, didn't live long, long life, and didn't end well and all um, based on that, um, not having a fear. Eventually, the judgment of God comes, and the Bible talks about judgment God first starts in the household of God first and then out in the world. So we're we're talking. This is um, in time prophecy teaching. But uh, we see things that happen on October 7th over in Israel and stuff that's going on with Russia and the Ukraine and all. And, and man, stuff that you see um, in the church, things that are going on. Man, it, it, it is um, very scary to um, drive folks to be on their knees. Here's some things that we need to keep in mind. I'm coming to my conclusion. Um, this has been a little bit more lengthy teaching than we did on Sunday evening, um, but I think it was much, much needed. First um, John chapter four, verse one. It says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they're God, because there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world. So you got to test the spirits. You see people, you see like Benny Hinn, I hate to say that, blowing on people and all these other stuff and, um, a lot of reports, quote unquote, you thought people were being healed, people died, and just some other things and all. Um, research some of the uh, Benny's fruit. I don't want to get into that, but it's not too good. And even his uh, nephew left his ministry. I think he went to the super end of the spectrum where he doesn't really believe in the gifts of the spirit anymore. He went to the obsessionist uh, camp. Um, which is a bit extreme, but it's just a lot of stuff, man, that's just going on. Um, let's go to First John chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. It says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves him, who's begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this, we know that we love the, the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 
and his commandments are not burdensome. So you have to keep God's commandments. If you love him, Jesus even said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You have to like maintain and keep his commandments. That's why I said in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, people didn't love truth. So they were given over to a strong delusion. So we have to make sure that we always love, love truth. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 through 14. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is man's all, or the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Um, God bless. Hopefully you receive something from this hour of teaching on false prophets, croaking frogs, lying signs and wonders in the last days. So not everybody that proclaims that they're a prophet is a true prophet. Remember, Jesus warned us several times over within the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, beware of, uh, of deception. Uh, we live in an age of deception where if it was so, be able to deceive the very elect. So we gotta be watchmen um, on the tower, be watchful, be prayerful, uh, be discerning what's going on, especially in this last and evil days. God bless. Um, this is Drill, the end time shofar, the end time Bible prophecy, um, Bible study for this evening. Um, take care. Pray for me as I pray for you. Um, God bless and uh, much blessings unto you. Amen.